Hess's Law and Enthalpy of Formation going to be the topics of this lesson. So kind of a two-part lesson. And uh, in the last lesson on calorimetry, we learned how we could go into the lab and actually measure uh, the heat given off in a reaction and use it to calculate the delta H of a reaction. But in this lesson, we're not going to step foot in the lab whatsoever. We're going to learn two methods to just look up some thermodynamic quantities in the back of your textbook or in some published tables and use them to calculate the delta H of the reaction. My name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, in addition to high school and college science prep, we also do MCAT, DAT, and OAT prep as well. You can find those courses at chadsprep.com. Now, this is part of my new general chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these lessons several a week throughout the school year. So if you wanna be notified every time I publish a new one, subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification. Let's get into this. So we're gonna start with Hess's Law, and then we'll save the last part of the lesson for enthalpy of formation. And both both of these are going to be methods and separate distinct methods for calculating the delta H of the reaction. So they should ultimately lead to the same answer. But what you're going to find out is that uh, the second method involving enthalpy of formation is going to be way easier. Hess's law is going to be a little bit of a pain in the butt and students usually walk away with a bad taste in the mouth. But hopefully we can make this a little bit easier. But the idea uh, for both these methods is that delta H is a state function. And as a reminder, that means that it is independent of path. As long as you have the same initial state and final state, then it doesn't matter how you get there. So it doesn't matter if you actually measure it in the lab, or it doesn't matter if you look up some thermodynamic quantities that all add up to the reaction that you have, uh, ultimately meaning you have the same initial state and final state. Uh, and that's what we're going to do in Hess's law here. So we're going to do three examples here. And the first example here, uh, is this one right here. This is the reaction we want to calculate the delta H for. And then I'm going to provide you these three reactions. Uh, and this is the thermodynamic data that's provided. And, and I say I'm providing you with three reactions here, but I'm actually providing you with significantly more than that. I'm actually providing you with an infinite number of reactions. Because if the delta H of this first reaction is positive 113 kilojoules, well, the delta H of the reverse reaction would be negative 113 kilojoules. You just reverse the sign. And same thing, if I give you the delta H of this reaction once again, that first one is 113 kilojoules. Well, what if I doubled everything? What if I made it four moles of NO2 going to four moles of NO plus two moles of O2? If you double everything in the reaction, well, that doubles the delta H. And instead of being 113, it would be 226 kilojoules, twice as much. And so really, I haven't given you just three reactions. I've really given you an infinite number of multiples as well. And from that infinite number of multiples, you have to pull out exactly the ones we need that are going to add up to exactly this. And if adding up some combination of these adds up to exactly this reaction, then adding up their delta H values will add up to the delta H of this reaction that we're looking for. So that's kind of the guys here. And there is a method to the madness. It is not random. So don't just kind of, you know, go willy nilly approaching at random. Uh, there is a method here and we're going to present that here. So. All right, so I usually just like to start with the first species in your reaction. That's going to be NO gas in this case. And you want to find, okay, where is NO gas showing up in your reaction? Well, NO gas is showing up right here and right here. And if it shows up in more than one of these reactions, you skip it. That's the last thing you want to worry about balancing. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to skip NO for a minute. So, okay, not worry about him. So we'll move on to N2O, and if we look for N2O here, the only place N2O shows up is right here. So, and the idea is that now, with it only showing up in that place, if whatever I do to this reaction, whether I keep it in the same direction, or reverse it, or double it, or cut it in half, or triple it, or whatever, whatever I do with it, if the number of moles of N2O show up just like they need to in my desired reaction, it will never change because it doesn't show up in any of the additional reactions. And so in this case, I need one mole of N2O and I need it to be on the product side of the reaction, the right-hand side. Okay, well, in this provided reaction, the N2O is on the correct side, it's on the product side, but it's two moles. And so we don't wanna use this reaction verbatim as it is, we wanna take this reaction and cut it in half. That way, instead of two moles of N2O on the product side, it'd be just one mole of N2O on the product side. And so the reaction we actually want to use is going to be N2 gas plus one half O2 gas going to N2O gas. And instead of the delta H being 163 kilojoules, the delta H is going to be one half times 163 kilojoules. Okay. 
not so bad. And again, the whole point in doing this is we just made sure that the N2O right here showed up exactly like we, oh, not there, that the N2O we need right here shows up exactly like we need it right here. Cool, and it's never going to change because it, it, no matter what combination we add the other two reactions, they don't involve N2O and that's fixed. Okay, great. One of them's done, good, let's move on to NO2. And if we look at NO2 here, uh, the only place NO2 shows up in all these reactions is right here in the first one. <clears throat> okay, so we can deal with that. And in this case, I want one mole of NO2, or I need one mole of NO2, and I need it to be, again, on the right-hand side, the product side of the reaction. Well, now we got a problem, because one, this is not on the product side, it's on the reactant side, and it's not one mole, it's two. So we're gonna have to do a couple things here. So we are gonna have to reverse this reaction and cut it in half. And so that's gonna not only cut it in half, but change the sign as well. And so if we do that, we're gonna end up with NO gas plus one half O2 gas going to now NO2 gas. So I cut all the coefficients in half and flipped it around. And so now it's gonna be negative one half times 113 kilojoules. And so notice I didn't actually change the number itself uh, that I reported here. I made the negative and the one half out in front. But if you would have made this one half times negative 113 kilojoules, same diff, same diff. All right, now this makes sure that the end, uh, in this case, the NO2 is going to end up exactly as we need it. And again, because the other reaction we have left to add doesn't contain NO2, this is never going to change. And so when I finally add these together, and it will end up adding all the reactants and all the, on one side and all the products on the other side, these will be showing up exactly as I need them to. Now we're prepared to deal back with the NO. And that's what we're gonna to do to get this third reaction to work. And so in this case, the NO, we need three moles of NO gas on the reactant side. And the problem we ran into at the beginning is that the NO showed up in two places. It showed up in the first reaction and the third reaction. But in this case, we've already added the first reaction in and we can factor that in. And so in that first reaction that we added in, and that was the one we added in second, but it's the first one in the list of thermodynamic data, we can see what happened with the NO. And in this case, we've already got one mole of NO on the reactant side. Well, if we wanna end up with a total of three moles of NO on the reactant side, I need two more moles of NO on the reactant side from that third provided reaction. And so in this case, we need again, two more moles of NO, but on the reactant side, well, okay, well, it's got two moles, it's the correct number, but it's on the product side. So we're gonna have to reverse the whole reaction here. And so we're gonna get two NO gas going to N2 plus O2. And if all we've done is reverse the reaction, that'll make it negative 181 kilojoules. All right, so now we're gonna take and add all these together. We've used every reaction that was provided. We're gonna add them all up together. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna combine all the reactants on one side and all, oh, let's get that correct, all the products on the other side. And anything that shows up on both sides is going to cancel. And the idea is that if we've done this correct, then it's gonna add up exactly to our desired reaction. And if these three add up to exactly this reaction, then their delta H's are gonna add up to exactly the delta H we're looking for. So let's verify this here. So here we've got N2 gas. <clears throat> plus one half O2 there and one half O2 there and one half O2 plus one half O2 is just O2. And then NO gas here plus two NO gas here is a total of three NO gas. Cool, and that's all the reactants. And now the products, we've got N2O gas and NO2 gas and then N2 and O2. Cool, and now we've got some things showing up on the reactants and product side. And again, anything that shows up on both sides in equal quantities is going to cancel. And so the N2 here is gonna cancel out the N2 here. The O2 here is gonna cancel out the O2 here. And if you look at what we got left with then, the only things we got left are gonna be three NO gas going to N2 O gas plus NO2 gas 
which is exactly the reaction we were provided with. So again, we chose how to add these three reactions in so that it would specifically add up to the one we wanted and we just verified that that's true. And so now all we have to do is add up these corresponding delta H's as they've been manipulated. So we're gonna take one half times 163 uh, minus one half times 113 and then minus 181. And we're gonna get negative 156 kilojoules here. Cool. And that's essentially how this method works. Now, one thing to note, this is a long process, right? And so and we're gonna do this long process for two more examples, just make sure you got it down pat. So however, when, once you get proficient at this and you're taking an exam, you may not actually work out the whole process and write the whole thing out. And the approach you might take would look something like this. You look and say, okay, I need three moles of NO gas on the reactant side. And you look at your provided thermodynamic data and you say, oh, NO shows up in two places, skip it. Okay, move on to the N2O. N2O here, I need one mole on the product side. This one has two moles on the product side, cut the reaction in half. And so you'd be like, okay, it's gonna be half of 163. Cool, so that one's used. And then you'd go and say, okay, I need one mole of NO2 gas on the product side. And the only place that NO2 shows up here, but it's two moles on the reactant side. And so you're gonna say, I'm gonna have to reverse it and cut it in half, which means it's gonna be half or negative one half of 113 in that case. And then you look at what you did and say, okay, uh, I used the NO in this one by reversing it and cutting it in half. I'd already have one mole of NO on the reactant side. I need two more moles. And the REAST reaction has to provide me those two more moles on the reactant side. So it's gonna get flipped. And that's gonna make this negative 181 kilojoules. And assuming you did everything right and used all the reactions you're provided with, so you could probably just be like half of 163 minus half of 113 minus 181 and you're done. So, and if you've done the process correctly, it'll work out. So key that this may not be all you need to do and that you may need, may need to really go through and verify this is if you haven't used all the provided reactions. If you haven't used all the provided reactions, that may be a little more complicated example and it may be worth your time to actually go back through. So, but usually on an exam, I recommend students if they get proficient with this, which they really should before an exam, is they kind of take this approach that we just did and then pick the answer choice, assuming they got one of the multiple choice answers that's on their test, and then go back at the end if and when they have time to verify the whole thing. Let's look at a couple more examples. All right, so now we've got the second example here. And, uh, and in this case, before we verify this, I'm actually just gonna work through this and kind of show you my methodology for working through it quickly. And then we will go back through and verify the whole thing. And so, in this case, the first reactant is C2H4 gas. And if we look at all of our thermodynamic data, the only place that C2H4 gas shows up is in the last provided reaction. Now I need one mole of C2H4 gas on the reactant side. This has one mole, but it's on the product side. So I'm gonna have to reverse the whole thing, which means instead of positive 52.3, that's gonna be negative 52.3 kilojoules. Okay, so far so good. And then I'll move on to F2. And if I look, F2 shows not only in the first reaction, but also in the second reaction, and we're just gonna skip it. It's the last thing we're gonna balance. So then we move on to CF4. And the only place that CF4 shows up in the provided data here is in the second reaction. And in this case, I look back and see that I need two moles of CF4 on the product side. Well, this only has one mole, but it is on the product side. And so I just need to double the whole reaction, which is gonna double that value. And so it's gonna be two times negative 680. And then finally, I've got HF here. And with the HF, I need four moles on the product side. And it only shows up in the first reaction, but it's not four moles, but it is on the product side. Uh, but to get it to be four moles on the product side, I've got to double the whole reaction, which again is going to double the delta H value. So it'd be two times negative 537. And notice we never worried about the F2 yet. We still haven't solved that one, but we've used every reaction. If we've used a reaction, assuming we've done the process right up to this point, we're actually done. And we would just simply go through, add those up and get our delta H. And that's actually in the end what we're going to do. But now we're going to verify it. But we could also look back and just make sure that F2 worked out the way it should. So because for this first reaction, we doubled it. That would give us two moles of F2 on the reactant side. And then for the second reaction, 
uh, we doubled it as well. And so that would give me an additional four moles of F2 on the reactant side and two from the first one, four from the second would give me six moles of F2 on the reactant side and that would have worked out. Great. So in this case, if you add these three numbers together, that will get you the delta H that we're looking for, but let's just go ahead and verify this. All right, so we said C2H4. We had to take that first reaction and flip it to make sure that we get one mole of C2H4 on the reactant side. And so we're gonna have C2H4 gas going to two carbon solid plus 2H2 gas. And that's gonna be negative 52.3 kilojoules. Since we reversed it, we changed the sign. And then we gotta make sure the F2 ends up in the right place, but we said because it shows up in two different reactions, we skip it. So then we move on to the CF4 and I've got two moles on the product side. It only shows up in the second reaction and it's on the correct side, the product side, but I've got to double the reaction to make sure it gets to be two moles. And so in this case, that's gonna give us two carbon plus four F2 going to two CF4. And that's gonna be two times negative 680. And then finally, we wanna look for the HF as well. And again, we want four moles of HF on the product side. Well, it's on the product side and the only reaction it shows up, that first one, but it's not four moles and I needed to double the whole reaction to make sure that it comes out to four moles. And so we'll have two H2 gas plus two F2 gas going to four HF gas. And since we doubled the whole reaction, we doubled the delta H value as well. And notice, same thing we were doing right back over here. And now we've used all the reactions. And again, we never worried about the F2, but we could go back and verify and be like, oh, well, I've got F2 there and F2 there. And that's going to get me a total of six moles on the reactant side, just as I need it. And so if we go back through now and add all three of these reactions together, we're going to get C2H4 gas plus two carbon solid solid. And I'll just combine these right here and make it plus six F2 gas. And then we miss this guy. So plus two H2. And that's going to give us on the other side, two carbon solid plus the two H2 plus the two CF4. And then finally plus the four HF. And again, once you've gone this far, anything that shows up in equal quantities on both sides of the reaction here is gonna cancel. And so our two carbon here are gonna cancel two carbon here. Our two hydrogen here are gonna cancel two hydrogen here. And what you're left with is C2H4 gas plus six F2 gas going to two CF4 gas plus four HF gas. And again, that's exactly the reaction we were looking for. And so if these three reactions add up to exactly the reaction we want, then their corresponding delta H's will add up to the exact delta H we want since delta H is a state function here. So we'll take negative 52.3 and we will go plus two times negative 680. And I guess you could have done minus two times positive 680, same diff and then plus two times negative 537, and we're gonna get negative 2486.3. Cool, and I'm not gonna care about sig figs on this problem. That's just the answer I was looking for. Don't worry about sig figs. Cool, we got one more example to work out, uh, but this is typically about how hard the, you know, the average problem is. There are some easier examples. There are a couple harder ones. This next one's gonna be kind of a little bit in that harder category. Let's take a look. So one last example on Hess's law here. And again, we'll do the, uh, the quick method first and then verify it second. All right, so we need one mole of C3H8 gas here. That's propane, it turns out. And the only place C3H shows up is in the first reaction. And I needed one mole on the reactant side. It's got two moles on the reactant side, so it's on the correct side, but I need just one mole. So I'll cut the entire reaction in half, which would then cut the delta H in half. And so it's gonna be one half of negative 2390. 
And then I need five moles of O2 on the reactant side. And the problem is, is that we got O2 showing up in both of the first and second reactions. So skip it, move on to CO2 gas here. And CO2 gas shows up in just the second reaction only. And in this case, I need three moles on the product side. This one's got one mole on the product side. So I need to triple the whole thing. It's on the correct side, but I need three times as many. So tripling that's gonna be three times negative 283. And then finally, I need four moles of liquid water on the product side. The only place liquid water shows up is right here. Uh, in this case, it's on the wrong side. I need it on the product side. This is on the reactant side. So I'll flip the reaction around, which will change the sign. And I also need four moles. So I have to multiply this whole reaction by four. And so it'll be an additional negative four times 40.7. So I use the same number, negative since we reverse the reaction and then multiply the whole thing by four. And again, if we just add these three values together because we've used all the reactions, as long as we've done the process right, this should work out. And adding these three should be what we're after. But let's go back and verify this. All right, so to make sure we got one mole of C3H8 on the reactant side, we took this first reaction, since it's the only one that contains it, and cut it in half. And so in this case, that would give us C3H8 plus seven halves O2 going to three CO plus four H2O gas. And since we cut the whole thing in half, again, that's gonna be one half of negative 2390 kilojoules. All right, O2, we said we were gonna skip because it showed up in two of the reactions. Now, technically, because we've already used that first reaction and we've got five moles, we could actually figure it out. It's just often easier to figure out the rest instead of figuring out, well, how many more do I need? Or what do I, how many do I need to cancel? Or, you know, so we're just gonna skip it still and move on to the CO2. And I need three moles of CO2 on the product side. This is the only reaction that's got CO2. It's on the product side, but I've got to triple the reaction here to make it work out to the correct number. And so we'll have three CO gas plus, in this case, three times a half is three halves O2 gas goes to three CO2 gas. And if we triple the whole reaction, it'll triple the delta H. And notice that's what we could have figured out as well here. We already had seven halves O2, that's three and a half O2. We need another one and a half O2, so that it would total up to five. So we actually could have figured out how to add this reaction in from the O2. It's just a little, a little harder to see and a little harder to do the math there. So I recommend if there's any other way to do it, by all means, go that other way. And then finally, we need four moles of H2O liquid. And the only place it shows up is here. It's on the wrong side. So we have to reverse it and we have to multiply the whole reaction by four. And so in this case, we'll get four H2O gas going to four H2O liquid. And that's gonna, in this case, be negative four, again, times 40.7. So same steps we took a second ago, and now we can add them all together. And we can actually shorten up the process because sometimes you can see which ones are gonna cancel and stuff like that. And sometimes you're like, okay, I got three CO on the product here. I got three CO on the reactant here. Those are gonna cancel. I can see that I'm gonna combine these guys. And then I can see that these four H2O gases are gonna cancel out with those four H2O gases. So we can do some canceling from the get-go. And so in this case, we still got the C3H8 gas. Seven halves plus three halves is 10 halves or plus five. O2 gas going to 3CO2 plus 4H2O. And once again, this adds up to the exact reaction we're looking for. And so these delta H values add up to the exact delta H value we're looking for as well. So in this case, one half times negative 2390 uh, plus three times negative 283 and then minus four times 40.7 is gonna get us negative 2206.8. All right, if you got the number, 2206.8. Cool, and that is our last Hess's Law calculation here. And so uh, we're gonna move on to talking about enthalpy of formation. And the example we're gonna calculate delta H for was actually the first example we did Hess's Law for. So go back and look at that delta H value because we're just about to use it in the next calculation using enthalpy of formation instead.
All right, so now we're ready for enthalpy of formation. And there's really two parts to this segment of the lesson here. And so first we are gonna use enthalpy of formation as a tool without even necessarily knowing what it is. And you can use it all day long without knowing anything about it. In fact, you do this all the time. In fact, you use your digestive system without knowing exactly how it works all the time. I'm sure you, uh, you know, got up this morning and popped a little bagel in your mouth and you said, Hmm, the salivary amylase in my saliva is starting to break down the glycosidic linkages between the sugars. And then you said, peristalsis is occurring and the smooth muscle in my esophagus is pushing it down. And, and then it's going to go through a sphincter into my stomach. And then we're going to have hydrochloric acid begin. No, you didn't think about any of this stuff. You just said bagel pie hole, bagel pie hole, and you shoved it in. So, and again, the key is, is you don't necessarily have to know how a tool works in order to use it, or at least how it knows, you know, how it works completely in order to use it. And the idea is here that we're going to use enthalpy of formation to calculate delta H of a reaction here before we actually talk about what an enthalpy of formation even is. So I just want to get that part across, but what it is is still going to be important, but it's not going to be important for the purpose of calculating delta H of a reaction, but there are other kind of questions they might ask you in its stead. So let's take a look here. So we want to calculate the delta H of this reaction right here. And we did it using Hess's law earlier and we got negative 156 K kilojoules. So now we're going to use enthalpy of formation and we're going to see that this is so much easier going this route than it was using Hess's law. And it's total plug and chuck. And so it turns out the delta H of the reaction is the sum of the delta H's of formation, the enthalpies of formation of the products, minus the sum of the enthalpies of formation of the reactants. And the N and the M here just refer to the, you have to multiply by the coefficients, how many moles you have for the, the products and the reactants respectively. And so on the study guide here, and I'll put it up on your screen, the delta H of formation, the enthalpy of formation for NO gas, N2O gas, and NO2 gas were all provided. And we're simply just gonna do products minus reactants. So we're gonna take that value for N2O. So we'll take delta H of our reaction is gonna equal value for N2O, which is given as 81.6 kilojoules per mole. And essentially what we're doing is multiplying this by one mole. So we'll put a little one mole and that cancels out the moles. So that's why it comes out to 81.6 kilojoules. And then we're going to add NO2's value in there as well. And that's going to be 33.8. So plus, and again, one mole times 33.8 kilojoules per mole. And that is all the products. And then we're going to subtract out the sum of all the reactants. Well, we only have one reactant, but there are three moles of it. So we'll take three moles and multiply by a value of, uh, in this case, 90.4. Cool, and that's the only, again, reactant we had. So we're doing products minus reactants. It is pure plug and chug. It is a much easier way to calculate delta H. The key though, is that you have to be given enthalpies of formation. If you're given enthalpies of formation and asked to calculate delta H, you should stand up in the middle of your exam and go up and kiss your professor. Now, if instead you're asked to calculate delta H of the reaction and then you're given a bunch of reactions, then you're, you know you're doing Hess's law and you should stand up and just get mean faced and shake your fist at your professor. So, Cool. From here, we're just ready to do some plugging and chugging, and we've got 81.6 kilojoules, 81.6 plus 33.8, and then minus 3 times 90.4, and we're going to get negative 155.8. kilojoules. And there's your answer. And if you recall, uh, when we did this with Hess's law, we got negative 156 kilojoules. And that just means that I supplied you with some rounded numbers somewhere, either here or over there. But effectively, it gives you the exact same answer, essentially negative 156 kilojoules. Now, one thing to note, students often mess this up. So you need to sum up all the products. You need to sum up all the reactants and then make sure you're doing products minus reactants. And oftentimes, if the sum of the reactants comes out negative, students forget to subtract the negative, which would make it positive and things of a sort. So just don't make that common error. So, but that's it. It's plug and chug. It is beautiful. And you didn't even have to understand what an enthalpy of formation is or how this even works. It is fantastic but you still need to know what it is and a little bit about how it works. So let's take a look at what that means.
All right, so we're going to talk about these enthalpies of formation. You should know what a formation reaction is because an enthalpy of formation is just the enthalpy of a formation reaction. Well, there's two qualities to a formation reaction. A formation reaction forms, hence the name, forms one mole of a single product. Whatever, you know, when you have the enthalpy of formation of, say, HCl, then the formation reaction is going to form exactly one mole of HCl. And so you're all formation reactions form exactly one mole of whatever it's the enthalpy of formation of, if you will. And then the reactants, though, have to be elements in their standard states. So you can't have any compounds on the reactant side, only elements, and they've got to be in their standard states. And so on, your, on the study guide here, I've put a whole table here of all the different standard states, and you should know those. Uh, but if a lot of you guys have got access to a, uh, one of those lovely periodic tables that puts, you know, segregates the elements into blue, uh, red and black, and black usually means it's a solid in the standard state. Blue would be like for mercury and bromine, which are liquids in the standard state. And then red would mean they're gases in the standard state. So if you've got access to one of those periodic tables, uh, then this isn't such a big deal. So however, carbon is special, and you should probably know that carbon's standard state, you can't just put solid. Um, some people let you get away with that at this stage, some professors, but technically because there's more than one solid allotrope, we say. So when, some, uh, when an element has more than one form in the same phase. We call them allotropes. And so for carbon, you have graphite and diamond. So, and it turns out one other form, but graphite and diamond, the two main forms of solid carbon, and it turns out graphite is the standard form because it's lower energy. And so if we were going to do a formation reaction involving carbon as the element on the reactant side, it would have to be carbon in the form of solid graphite, not solid diamond, FYI. So let's take a look at what a couple of formation reactions look like. So let's just say we want the formation reaction for NaCl in any phase, doesn't matter. You could just put the phase on. So uh, it doesn't have to be the standard phase for the product, just the reactants have to be in the standard states. So we're gonna make one mole of NaCl solid. So this will be the enthalpy of formation for NaCl is what this reaction would correspond to. Uh, and in this case, you gotta make it from its individual elements in their standard states. Well, the only elements that make this up are sodium and chlorine. And so we're gonna put sodium plus chlorine, no compounds, only elements, but now we gotta go standard state. And sodium, being a metal that's not mercury, is gonna be a solid. Mercury would be a liquid and all the rest of the metals are solids in the standard state. Uh, and then chlorine, you gotta remember, is one of those seven diatomics, so, and is a gas in the standard state, and then you gotta balance it. And so, in this case, you might be tempted to do this. You might be tempted to put a two right here to balance the chlorines and then put a two right here, except you're not allowed to do that right now. So this is how we'd normally do it to balance a reaction like this to avoid fractions. The problem is, is you put a two right here and a formation reaction forms one mole of a single product and this would not be a formation reaction. So uh, in this case, you can't double things through to avoid a fraction. In this case, you're just gonna get stuck with a fraction. And if you don't write fractions, then write, use a decimal, write 0.5, but you're stuck. You can't just double this through. This is the proper formation. So if you look up in the back of your textbook, the enthalpy of formation for NaCl solid, you're actually looking up the enthalpy change associated with this reaction right here. Let's make this a little harder. Let's say we wanna find the enthalpy of formation for sodium bicarbonate. And so if we're looking up, you know, the formation reaction for sodium bicarbonate, then we're going to form exactly one mole of sodium bicarbonate from its individual elements in their standard states. And so we got sodium and we've got hydrogen and we've got carbon and we've got oxygen. Cool. And now we've got to put them in their standard states. And again, sodium is a solid. So hydrogen and oxygen are diatomics. So, and they're gases, both of them, it turns out as well. And then carbon, if you recall, was a special one. And again, for some of you, your professors will dumb it down a little bit. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way in any shape or form. Uh, but they're going to have you just write carbon solid. But for many of you, they're going to get specific and say, you've got to tell me that it's solid graphite, not solid diamond, for instance. If we put diamond here, that's not a formation reaction. It's got to be graphite. The most stable, lowest energy form is the standard state. Cool, and then we gotta balance this thing. And in this case, the sodium is good, but for the hydrogen, we're gonna have to put a one half right here. 
carbon is good. And for the oxygen, we're going to have to put a three halves right here. And again, the temptation is going to want to be to double this all the way through, but that would put a two here as well. And that would not be a formation reaction. So here we're stuck. This is the formation reaction for solid sodium bicarbonate and AHCO3. And you can't double through to get rid of these fractions. You're just stuck with them. Cool, so now you know what a formation reaction is, you know how to write one. You might get a question on your test that just says, which of the following is a formation reaction? And you got five answer choices, right? And a multiple choice question. Well, first thing I usually do is zero in on the products. And I look and say, is it forming just one product and just one mole? Then I can't rule that one out. But anything that's forming more than one product or has multiple moles of a product, that's out. And then I would go back and say, okay, look at the reactants and anything that would have compounds over here, not just elements, but compounds, those are out. And then I look at what I have left and make sure all the elements are in their standard states. All right, so that's one sort of question you might get. Uh, or you might just get, you know, which of the following is the formation reaction for NaCl? And obviously be looking for this exact reaction in such case. All right, so let's go back and look at the calculation we just did. The calculation we just did was for three NO gas going to N2O gas plus NO2 gas. And we'll see why this works the way this is, because it turns out this enthalpy of formation actually is just a special specific application of Hess's law. Now let's just say that, you know, I wanted to put a, uh, an AC unit in here because it is rather warm right now. These lights are crazy. And I want to put an AC unit over in this wall, put in a wall unit. And so I need a hole in that wall for it. And so I decided the best way to get that AC unit in there was to tear down this entire room all the way to the ground, pure rubble, and then to build it back up, but just to build it back up with a little hole right there for a window AC unit. Uh, and this might not be the best way to build this, but I, I guess it could work, but it's probably not the most economical. But essentially that's the kind of method we're using when we do Hess's law. Because what we're doing is we're taking all our reactants and pretend that pretend pathway here is to break it up into its individual elements in their standard states. And then to take those individual elements and combine them to form the products. And so if you notice, if you take individual elements in their standard states and you form products, well, that's what a delta H of formation is for the products. However, if you, if you took you know, your reactants and broke them up in the individual elements, that's the exact reverse reaction of a, of a formation reaction. A formation reaction would take these indiv individual elements and make the reactants. That would be a formation reaction. Since this is the reverse process, then it would be the exact negative of the delta H of formation of the reactants. And obviously you gotta multiply by how many moles you have and stuff like this, but that's why we take the enthalpy of formation of the products minus the enthalpy of formation of the reactants. That's what's going on. So uh, that's why this process works. It's a real special application of Hess's law because again, as long as we start here and end here, it doesn't matter how we get there. If we get there in some direct you know, reaction or if we have this imaginary pathway that breaks it up into individual elements and then forms them up into your products. It doesn't make a difference as long as you have the same initial state and the same final state. So you'll get the same delta H because delta H is a state function. Cool, and that's the two parts, the enthalpy of formation. So you gotta be able to do the plug and chug, products minus reactants, and that's the most common kind of question. But then you gotta have some level of understanding of what a formation reaction is. And you might, again, just get a question that says, which of the following is a formation reaction? And you gotta be able to recognize that. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like? One of the best things you can do to make sure YouTube shows this lesson to other students as well. And if you're looking for practice problems or my study guide or practice final exams, chapter tests, uh, final exam rapid review, then check out my general chemistry master course at chadsprep.com. I'll leave a link in the description. A free trial is available. Happy studying.